Good morning. I can still see many empty chairs waiting for some of the saints who are still outside. We would like to invite them to come and we will appreciate so much if they could come and have their seats so we can start our presentations. It's always good to begin our presentation when everybody is seated so that nobody will be going back and forth. Okay, I would like to say good morning again. How many of you here are happy today? Raise your hands. Okay, thank you very much. Those of you who are not really happy, who is, who, who is feeling very heavy this morning, just raise your hands and we will include you in our prayer as we begin. Okay, thank you, sister. Anyone else who would like to have your name bring before the throne of grace this moment as we come to the Lord in prayer? Shall we bow our heads? <coughs> Heavenly Father, we would like to praise you and we would like to thank you for the blessings that we have received today. It has been a wonderful day, Father. We thank you for another day, another gift that we have received from God. Another day you have added to our existence on this earth. Another day to serve and another day to enjoy the blessings that you have provided to mankind. This morning, Father, you have seen the hands of our literature evangelists who have rose up, who have signified that they have some heavy burdens this morning, some care that they would like to bring before thy throne of grace. O oh Lord God, we pray that you will look down upon them with your love and mercy. Grant them, O oh God, the, the answer to the petitions of their heart. We know that silently they are praying at this moment, and whispering to you the burdens that they have. And we pray that you will give your listening ears. And also, Father, we pray that you will give the response to the request. And at this moment, we invite your Holy Spirit to be in our midst. Fill this room with your presence. That your name will be glorified. And all of us who will be listening to your words will be blessed. Thank you, Father. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your people today. In the loving name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the Lord for the message of Pastor Mwansa this morning. How many of you enjoyed that message? Amen. You know, management of our life and management of our finances are very, very important aspects of our publishing ministry. Okay? Now, uh, in relation to that, you know, how many of you can remember the last rule... After you have tried everything, what is the last rule to have a happy life? Simplicity. Simplicity. Very good. I like to tell you a story in relation to that uh, theme or to that principle in our Christian experience. <coughs> One day, <clears throat> I was traveling and I decided to buy the cheapest ticket, air ticket. We usually buy the cheapest ticket at the GC so that we have enough travel budget so we can visit different places and many places around the world. And so we decided to buy the cheapest ticket. You know, after I checked in, uh, the, the lady in the counter told me and said, Sir, your ticket is the cheapest kind of ticket. And so I said, yes, so what, is, what, uh, so what about? And he said, because it's the cheapest ticket, you cannot choose your seat. And so you are going to be to sit where you will be assigned. And so I said, but I said, could you just please give me a little closer to the front? He said, no, you are assigned in the very last seat next to the comfort room, next to the toilet. And so I said, oh my. I said, could you please have little consideration? He said, you know, uh, um, I am going to that place to preach. I said, he said, who are you? He said, I'm a pastor. He said, well... I understand that you're a pastor, but your ticket says that you have to sit down next to the toilet. And I said, it's okay. So I sat down in the toilet. I mean, next to the toilet. <laughs> and uh, very interestingly, while I was seated, 
you know, the stewardess arrived and distributed meals, you know, as you always experience that during your flight. They will give you sandwich and soup drink and a bottle of water. <coughs> uh, please forgive my cup, you know, it's not getting away. I prayed last night, but it's still here. But let's pray that it will go away tomorrow or the rest because I still have two weeks trips. I have another Division LA Congress in ECD and another one in WAD next week. So, um, and I had only one day in the GC and I had to fly again. Anyway, that's not part of the story. Um, while the stewardess were serving the, the, the sandwich and the bread, rather the water and the juice, so I got also, um, uh, you know, this juice that is in a box and, a, and a one little bottle of water. I was about to open the little bottle of water and I said, Madam, do you know that I am in the cheapest ticket? They call that Econolite, economy or Econolite. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I forgot. Please give me back the water, give me back the orange juice, and give me back the sandwich. So I have to return back the water. I was about to drink, and I have to return back the sandwich, and I have to return back the juice. And I said, Lord, is this the price of being simple? <laughs> and God said, yeah, but don't worry. Don't worry. Just relax. Just relax. You are saving money for the Lord. And we, and, uh, and you know, I, I, I get this impression that we, <coughs> we, we are saving money for the Lord's cause and for the work of God. You know, I was flying the whole time thinking about simplicity and saving God's money and also our own. But when we landed, I discovered one thing that concluded everything. said, so when we landed, I discovered that those in the business class and those that in the economy class and even me who was in the last seat arrived at the same time. <coughs> my beloved literature evangelist, I would like to tell you this this morning as a beginning of my presentations. In this part of eternity, in our life on earth, it seems that life is not fair. Some of us are sitting on a business class. Some people seem to have everything. Some people seem to enjoy all the goodness of life. And we seem that we are sitting at the very last seat next to the toilet. But let me tell you one thing. If we are faithful, if we'll just remain faithful to Jesus and look up to Him, when Jesus comes, we will arrive at the same time. And so, my beloved literature evangelist, Keep courage in the Lord. We know and I know that all of us are facing different, different kinds of, uh, of trials and challenges in our ministry. I like to tell you that in the church, uh, literature ministry is not the easiest work. Probably it's one of the most difficult and the most challenging. And we all know that. But I am so happy that because of this challenging ministry, we have learned to trust in God completely. We have learned to bend our knees in prayer in times of trials. And in times of trouble, we have learned to sing. We have learned to look up. Now, let me tell you one more thing before I begin my presentation. Somebody said that sorrow is looking back. Worry is looking around. But faith is looking up. And so this morning, I would like all of us this moment, all of us this morning, to look up in faith to the Lord that we serve, to Jesus, who is the leader of the publishing ministry, of the real publishing director of the World Church. Amen? Okay, may the Lord bless all of us as we begin and as we continue our journey in the, in, 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 in the conduct of our work as literature evangelists. Many of you remember yesterday what we have talked about. I'm sorry that I cannot talk very loud. I have to speak slowly so that I will not cough very often. Is it okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to preserve my voice. Yesterday I tried to exert my effort and I kept on coughing. Now, <coughs> yesterday we talked about uh, 
keeping the vision alive. And I presented to you one thing, how to keep the vision alive. And number one, how to keep the vision alive in our life or in our experience is to know our roots. Amen? To know our roots. And we know yesterday that the foundation of the publishing ministry is the example that God has done at Mount Sinai. That is our root. Our publishing work and our ministry is rooted in what God has done and what God has done through Moses and what God has, a plan, uh, what God has planned for you and for me. Now, this morning, I'm going to share with you another principle on how we can take or make or keep that vision alive. Number two is knowing your spiritual gift. That is very important in our ministry. Knowing our spiritual gift is very important on how to keep that vision alive in our ministry. If there are a group of people in the world who should really be so sincere and serious in keeping the vision alive, they are those who are working for the church in the publishing ministry, publishing leaders and literature evangelists alike. Are we together? If you agree with me. Uh, okay, so the first question is, who are we? Identifying our spiritual gift. And later on, as part of this presentation, number three would be knowing your mission. So number one, knowing your roots. Number two, you and your, knowing your spiritual gift. And number three, knowing your mission. Okay, now first let's look at knowing your spiritual gift. The first question that I like you to consider this morning is this. Uh, who are you? Who are we? <coughs> when you happen to visit a church and somebody meets you in the church and will ask you the question, who are you? What are you doing? What would be your answer? You will say, naturally, I'm what? I'm a literature evangelist. And then another, another question follows that says, what is a literature evangelist? Oh, anybody who sells books. You know, I, I like us to have a better glimpse of our spiritual gift and who we are so that we can tell people correctly who we represent and what we do. Okay, now the question is settled and I would like to share with you another biblical base. Okay, every day in our presentations, I will give you one text that will serve as our basis for keeping the vision alive. This morning, our basis is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. Okay, are you ready? Okay. I would like to request you as, far as, as, as much as possible to help me read this text. <coughs> At the early beginning, when the church was just developing or just beginning, God distributed the spiritual gift in the local church to be used by the children of God to accomplish His mission. Right? Okay, now, the question is, what is our spiritual gift? I, let's read together. Okay, ready? Begin. And God had set some in the church. Again. Secondarily, prophets. Thirdly, teachers. And after that, what's the next? Miracles, gift of healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. Now, very quickly, I'd like you to count in just a few minutes or maybe one minute, how many gifts are mentioned in this text? Quickly, okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, eh? Three gifts? <coughs> Nine? Okay. Now, I'd like you to count. How many spiritual gifts are given in this very particular text? How many says ten? Okay, how many says Nine? Okay, how many say? Somebody said three. Three. Is there any other number? Yes, sister. Three. How many? Four. Somebody said eight. Who said eight? 
Eight. Okay. We will count. Okay. Now, notice here that it says here first, then second, and then third. And then the Bible says after that. Okay. Now, I'd like you to watch out. Okay. So here are the spiritual gifts. And let's find out who is correct regarding how the number. Okay. First is what? Okay, the Bible says, I did not say that. Second, the prophets. And the third, teachers. Wow, the teachers are uh, third place. Okay, and the second place are the prophets. Today, we call them pastors. Okay, and after that, there is no more first, second, third, or fourth. It's what? Just miracles, and then healing, and then helps, and then administrations, and then varieties of tongues like those who are translating to French and translating also to Portuguese. Now, I'd like you to count again. How many gifts are mentioned here? Eight. So those of you who said eight, you are correct. Amen. Okay, so there are eight gifts. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, helps. Those are working support staff, administration, varieties of tongues. Now, I'd like you to identify and give an example in the church who are those who have received this gift. For example... Who are those in the church who have received the gift of tongues? Ah, those who are very good translators. You know, this is a spiritual gift in the church. Can you imagine if we don't have translators? So many people will never understand what I'm talking about, right? Can you imagine if all of us just speak one language? But praise the Lord, God has given in the church this spiritual gift of tongues. I tell you, I like to assure you, that I have met people who can speak six major languages very fluently. Back and forth. And I said, wow, I'm amazed. I'm amazed. That is a spiritual gift. And not all of us have that gift. Right? Okay. Do you have that gift, sister? You are shaking your head. A little bit. You speak ten. Wow. Amen, sister. Congratulations. Here's another example of... A uh, spiritual gift. So what are the languages you speak? English and Donga. Wonderful. Okay, I know you. I believe you. Okay, now. Well, those of you, another gift is administration. Who do you think has the gift of administration? Ah, they are our presidents, our treasurers, our secretaries in the conference. They are administrators. They administer the work of God. And I tell you, I have met people who are very good administrators. And in general conference, I know of one who is a very good administrator. All the others are good, but I think he is, as far as I'm concerned, better than all the rest. I'm not going to tell you his name, but I know him to be a very good administrator, very approachable, very kind, very gentle, very fair, and a lover of the spirit of prophecy. Okay? So some of you here have that gift of administration. Now, let me see. How many of you here are administrators? Measure your hand, either president, treasurers, or, or secretary of the conference, or union. Measure your hand. Oh, yes, I have seen there my good friend, Pastor Mulambo. Yes, that's a sad example of the gift of administration. Okay, what about the gift of uh, help or support, support staff? These are the workers in the church who are cleaning our... <coughs> cleaning our conference office, janitors, secretaries, accountants. They are simple people, but I tell you, they are doing excellent work. You know, in the general conference, nobody will know if I am not in the office for one month. Nobody will know. Nobody will miss me except my secretary and, of course, my wife. But if the janitor of the general conference will be missing for one day, everybody will know. And everybody will miss him. Oh, where is our janitor? He did not report today. You see, they are not looking for the director. They are looking for the janitor. It's a special gift. Okay, what about healing? Healing. Yes, we have doctors. Dr. Liagono, nurses. These are the people who receive the gift of healing in the church. And we need it to complete and to accomplish the work of God. What about the gift of miracles? Do we have people in the church? Oh, yes. They pray and miracles happen. 
You know, I, I, I really admire these people who really pray so sincerely as if, you know, just as if Jesus is just in front of them. It is a spiritual gift, mind you. And then another one is the gift of teaching. Some of you also have the gift of teaching. But these are primarily for those who are involved in teaching the Word of God. Teachers in our schools, they have the gift of teaching. And, the se- and, and what about the second? The prophets. We call them pastors or ministers today. They also have that gift. You know, I love my, past- my pastor. But each pastor has a different gift. Like for example, in my church, I missed our former pastor. He did not preach very well, but he loves every member. And he visits the member of the church. But my pastor today is a very good preacher. I tell you, he speaks even every Sabbath and everyone is spellbound. But many of us still miss the previous one. But we both love them. But each one is different. Each one has a different gift. Now, we come to the number one. He says, first are the apostles. Who are the apostles? Okay, before we identify the first gift, I'd like to ask you the question. What is your gift as a literature evangelist? Yes. You're one who is sent. Okay. Good. Now, if you look at all these different gifts, eight of them, you can hardly, somebody said, Pastor, I could not find myself there. There is no literature evangelist. Did God forget? Now, let me ask you, did God forget the literature evangelist when he distributed the spiritual gift in the church? Yes or no? no. If no, then where and what? Apostles. Apostles. Anyone else? Teacher. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. <coughs> Any other answer? Yeah. Where, where are you there? Who are we? Number one. And? Administrators. Okay. Yeah. Healing. 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 The what? Yeah. The, uh, among the eight here, I like you to identify where you belong because this is important. Remember, before we can keep the vision alive, we must know our spiritual gift. We must know who we are and what is our mission. Yes. Huh? Prophets. Okay. Uh, 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 ministering to the needs of the people. Yeah. All of them. Wow. All of them. Can you say amen to that? Amen. All of them. Yes, sister. Teachers, okay, yes. One and three. Okay, let me tell you, all of you are correct. But, there is a big but. Okay, now you are ready for this. We have identified who the seven are, but we have not identified who the apostles are. And many of you said we are the apostles, when I have not told you who are the apostles. How are sure are you that we are the apostles when we don't know who are they? Okay, now, if you are ready, we will identify what is an apostle. That is the question. Then after we identify that, probably some of us will be ready to identify who we are and what gift we have received from the Lord. Anybody, okay, anybody what is an, uh, know what is an apostle? Yeah. Huh? A messenger. Very good, Yes. Aha, uh-huh. okay. So a disciple, he said, is a follower. And an apostle is a disciple who is sent out. Is that correct? Ah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. So an apostle is anyone in the church who is sent out. Amen? Anybody in the church who is sent out is an apostle. Now, i like, now I like you to keep your peace. Not yet. I don't like you to make yet the conclusion who we are. Because we know that an apostle is anyone who is sent out. But we have the other gifts also in the church. Okay, 
So an apostle is sent out for the mission of Christ. Anybody in the church, do you think anybody or anybody in the church can be an apostle? Oh, I repeat my question. Do you think everybody can be an apostle? <coughs> okay, you, you believe that everybody will have the same gift? No, I think the, the, the answer is everyone has received a spiritual gift. And it is our responsibility to discover what gift we have received from the Lord so that we can use them, you know, uh, uh, for the glory of God. So an apostle is one who is sent out for the mission of Christ. Now, I would like to ask you a question. What is the work or the nature of our work as literature evangelist? Do we belong to the group of members in the church who are sent out? Yes or no? How many of you believe that you are called and you are sent out? Okay, thank you so much. I would like to congratulate all of you this morning, and I would like to declare a change in your name from a literature evangelist to modern apostle. Amen? Amen. 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 So I would like to go down and shake your hands. I will be the first one to shake your hand as modern apostles of God. Okay. Congratulations, apostle, 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 apostle. Apostle, apostle, you are the apostle. I did not say that. Okay. <laughs> okay, now I, we have 43,000 modern apostles in the church today. Do you know that? But not only you. There are many other church members who may not be literature evangelists, but are willing to be sent out for Christ's mission. But definitely literature evangelists are. Amen. Amen. And so I like... To let all of you know that beginning today, you are the modern apostles of Jesus. Amen. According to the scriptures and according to the, uh, according to the writings of Ellen G. White. Okay, now, <clears throat> uh, literature evangelists, fair of all, are called. Do you agree with that? Yes, we are called and we are sent out for Christ's mission. This is our spiritual gift. Now, when somebody asks you in the church, who are you? Who are we? Now... We know how to tell them and explain what we do. And so one way to really keep that vision alive is knowing our identity and especially our spiritual gift. Okay, now, uh, the same question that we ask ourselves. Yesterday I told you that every time I have I attend LA Congress, I change my presentation and remove the pictures of the local division and replace it with all the other divisions. But when I go to the other division, I will erase their pictures and put yours. <clears throat> so who are, <clears throat> who are we? This Eli is from Mexico. He is from Brazil. He is from the Philippines. <clears throat> Literature evangelists are called by God and sent out for Christ's mission. So we, are, we belong to the modern apostle. Now, do you remember or do you know of anyone in the Bible <clears throat> who is called an apostle? Who? Paul. Okay. Let's look at it and find out the characteristics of an apostle. Now, you have just claimed that we, by the grace of God, have received the gift of apostleship. But it's not something that we should rejoice. It is something we need to thank God for and believe that we are called and also be responsible for what apostles must do. Okay, I am Paul. He was introducing himself. Number one, a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, and separated to the gospel of God. Now, I'd like you to look very carefully at this text and tell me the three characteristics of an apostle. <coughs> okay? Are you ready? Number one. Yeah? Oh, yes. <laughs> the number one characteristics of an apostle is being a servant of who? Of Jesus. Wow. Now I would like to see all of you this morning as a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen? Are you willing to be a servant of Jesus? I don't care to be a servant as long as my master is Christ. But it's, sometimes it's painful and sometimes it's not so good to be a servant of man. But let me tell you, to be a servant of Jesus is worthwhile. Okay, now, and the second 
qualification of an apostle? Called. He is called. And number three, what he says, another, another qualification? Separated. Now, I would like to say here, who are literature evangelists, we are like Paul. Number one, called to be an apostle. Number two, servants of Jesus. And this is the most important. Number three, you are separated for what? To proclaim the gospel of Jesus. And if you please, can I add one more word that is not in the Bible? I like to add the word only. And so, one of the characteristics of an apostle is to proclaim, or rather separated, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus only. Only the gospel of Jesus. Not our own gospel or not the gospel of others. Is that clear? Because I know that some literature evangelists are preaching other gospels. I know in some parts of the world that some literature evangelists have many other kinds of books in their bags. I was talking to a literature evangelist one day and he said, Pastor, please, I need your help. For many, many years I was credential, but this time I cannot reach anymore my credential. I need your prayer. I said, well, <coughs> maybe you are not praying. He said, Pastor, I'm praying. Maybe you are not working. He said, I'm working. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, I don't know. And so I asked him, could you please open your Atachi case? And he said, no, pastor, everything is well. I don't need to open, just pray for me and I'll be okay. And he said, no, I, before I pray, I like to open, I like to see what is inside. And you know, after so many times he requested me, but I will not pray until I see what is inside. He finally was forced to open the Atachi case. And I know what I found? You know, right? <laughs> Inside that bag, of course, is one or two books that we sell. And all the others, like perfume, uh, Avon, and other things. I said, what are these? Oh, pastor, they are just simple things, little things, so that when I cannot sell my books, I will sell this to the customer so I have my money to, eat, to pay my fare going home. And I said, now listen, my friend, young man, do you know the reason why God is not blessing you? Because you are asking the Lord to bless your ministry and to bless this inside your bag that you know that God cannot bless. Now, beloved literature evangelist, I'd like you to remember this. Many times in our prayer, we insult God by asking Him to bless something that He cannot. And we know it. Are you with me? And so, I would like to appeal to all of us this morning, if we would like to be truly literature evangelists and truly be called modern apostles, called to be an apostle, servant of Jesus, we must be willing to be separated for nothing else but just for pro proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. What do you say? Amen. The gospel of Jesus. No sidelines. One of the greatest problems we are facing in the publishing ministry today is to have mixed multitude in our ranks. You know what is mixed multitude? You know the time, the Israelites, you know, some of them are praying, but still God is not blessing them because there are people in the group that God cannot bless. And I hope that there are no mixed multitude in the ranks of our literature evangelists in this division. And you know exactly what I mean by mixed multitude. We would like to see our ranks of literature evangelists who are truly called by the Lord, who are truly separated for mission, nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. That is the kind of literature evangelist God is looking for. And if we would like to keep that vision alive, we must know who we are and we must know what God expects from us. Okay, so here, uh, that's the word I added only. Now, um, a literature evangelist is called, and, and, and we can see that from the writings of the prophet, right? Here, we can find here in Colportor Ministry, page 18, the Lord calls. You see how the Lord calls. And in, in his letter, uh, her letter, Ellen White, uh, page, uh, rather, letter 124 in 1902, she said, God calls. So, you read 
the spirit of prophecy. You read the Culporter ministry, and every time you see a literature evangelist about his work, you will see there uh, always beginning, the Lord calls and God calls, and therefore you and I are called. Amen? Amen. What a privilege to work for the Lord. You know, what a privilege to be called, not by man, not by any committee, but by God Himself. Okay. You know that Paul also was called. Paul was called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, let me ask you. By whose will are you called? By the will of God. Are you sure? No, some of us here were called by the will of the committee. Uh, maybe some of us were called by the will of your leader. Maybe some of us are just staying in the ministry because you like your leader. And when the leader changes it, oh, no, 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 no. I have met so many literature evangelists who have quit in their ministry. And when I visited them, he said, Pastor, I am going to come back to the work when we have a new publishing director. You know, he, you know I feel so sad about that. We are called by the Lord and we are responsible to Him and our ministry is for Him and not for man. Now, <coughs> and like Paul, all of us were called to be apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and not by the will of man. And that makes me happy. You know, all of us have trials and challenges in our ministry. But I would like to tell you that, that the sacrifices that Jesus has suffered exceeds more than any sacrifice that we are facing. Even mine. You know, it's not so easy. If you have the world publishing program in your right shoulder and the health of your family and your wife on the left. It is not so easy after you come from the office, you come home and you still be the one to clean the house and cook for your food for your family. Have you tried that? But the Lord is good. And the greatest source of inspiration for anyone who labors sincerely for the Lord is the fact that you are doing it for the master. Is the fact that you are doing it for the Lord and that gives you inspiration and motivation. The greatest motivator in the publishing ministry is our love for Jesus and our love for the ministry. Regardless of what you think, regardless of what you say, that is our greatest motivator. And I have always believed in my ministry for the last 36 years that those who have stayed in the ministry are those who love Jesus the most and love this ministry the most. But those who love the money the most are the shortest lived. Those that did not stay in the ministry for long. This morning, Pastor Monsa spoke very appropriately for literature evangelists. We have to manage our finances. Okay, now... Uh, <coughs> Here is the calling of God, and i like you to read this text. This is very important for all of us. In chapter 1, uh, 11, uh, verse 29 of the book of Romans, there is a statement there about your gift. Your gift. By the way, do you know why you are here today and during this Congress? I am praying to the Lord every time we have early Congress that we will have men and women who are here by chance. But I am praying to the Lord that all of us are here by choice. You know what I mean? By chance. Yeah, by chance. But by choice, it is the ministry is in your heart. This work is in your heart. This Congress is in your heart. And you know that by being here, we will be blessed. And we will be able to continue working for Him. But you know, I like, to, I like all of us to consider this text. Okay, if you have your Bibles, you can open. But we can read together from the board or from the screen. Okay, it says here, For the gifts... And the calling of God are what? <laughs> what? Now, is there anyone here who can explain to me what the word irrevocable means? Eh? Yes, sister. What is irrevocable? 
cannot be cannot be reversed. Wow. Remember this, you are reading something that's very important and it's not from any writer, it's from the hand of God. For the gift and the calling of God are irrevocable. And if the calling of God for you, and if your gifts are irrevocable, that, why are you here? And what are we supposed to do? Is there any other definition of the word irre irrevocable? It, it cannot be reversed. You know, eh? cannot be permanent. It is permanent. You know, uh, I was reading a newspaper one time, and in that newspaper, the picture of a very famous government official who resigned as a minister of the cabinet of the president. And he wrote a letter to the president and said, uh, uh, Effective January 1, 2009, I am submitting my resignation as the secretary of health of this government. And in that, last, in that letter, in the last sentence, it says, and this resignation is irrevocable. Sign. Now, what if you receive a letter from the Lord and you say, and it says there, you are called by the Lord to be a literature evangelist. God has given you the spiritual gift. And God has called you to this ministry. And this calling and these gifts are irrevocable, signed by the hand of God. What do you say? You know, I have seen so many literature evangelists who have quit from the ministry. This is my challenge. You know, uh, if you are sitting where I sit, you will see the world and it's difficult. I mean, so many diverse challenges. But one of the challenges we face is the very rapid turnover of literature evangelists. We recruit, we train, we spend, and then at the end of the year, so many will quit. Then we recruit and spend and just going like that. We keep on recruiting and we keep on losing. Do you, do you know what I mean? You understand. Do you know why? I'm sorry to say this, but they are not sure of what their calling is and their spiritual gift. But let me tell you, those of you who are here, even someday you'll be tempted to quit. Let me tell you, that calling and that gift that you have received will remain in you because it is irrevocable. Why don't you go home and try to visit one of the literature evangelists in the past who is very faithful and tell him, if he is still a literature, uh, if he is not a literature evangelist today, ask him frankly if he still feels the calling of God. And most likely will tell you, yes. I have recruited back a literature evangelist who have been away for 15 years. And when he came back, I see came back, I said, why did you finally decide to come back? He said, Pastor, I am tired of saying no to the Holy Spirit. And so I would like my beloved literature evangelist, all of us this morning to embrace this fact and this truth. You are called by the Lord for Christ's mission. And we are separated for the gospel. And remember, God gives you the spiritual gift and then He calls. And then we give you that gift and God calls you. That calling and that gift are irrevocable. Okay. <coughs> I think we have seen that. We are called and sent out. So literature evangelists, therefore, have received the gift of apostleship. Okay, now. The gift of apostleship because we are sent out. So here, we would like to review the eight spiritual gifts. And tell me what is missing. Okay, we have the prophets. We have the teachers, miracles, healing, helps, administration, variety of time. What is missing here? <coughs> the apostles. And because we have changed that, right? We have changed that. And so if I am given the privilege to rewrite the Bible... But I know that the Lord will not allow that. But we know what we mean, that anyone who is called in as a puzzle, anyone who is sent out in a puzzle, and if all of you here believe that you are called and you are sent out, you have the right to say yes. And you can have also rewrite the text by saying here in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God had said some in the church, first, what? 
No, I didn't hear you. First, what? Second, prophets. Third, and then, and then, gifts of healings and helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. Amen? May the Lord bless you. Now, uh, this is our spiritual gift. So, to maintain or keep the vision alive, number one is to know our roots. Number two is to know your spiritual gift. Now, you know what is our spiritual gift. What is our spiritual gift? Apostleship, right? Sent out, being called to be sent out for Christ's mission. Now, the question number three, sent to where? And this will identify our mission. So, what is your root? What is your gift? And now, this moment, I'm going to share with you during the next 15 minutes, what is our mission? Okay? Are you ready? Okay. Uh, here is our mission. Okay? Uh, Call for Tour Ministry, page 4. Our publications should go everywhere. There are many places in which the voice of the minister cannot be heard. Places which can be reached only by what? By our publications. Ah, places that can be reached only by our publications, where the voice of the ministers cannot be heard. And listen to what Ellen White said. In such places, the faithful literature evangelist takes the place of the living preacher. Amen? So, our mission is to go to places where pastor's voice cannot be heard. Is that clear? I was in a union where many of the literature evangelists were concentrating their sales to the church members to reach their credential goal. <laughs> Is that our mission? Thank you, sister. Our mission, according to our calling and our spiritual gift, is to go to places where pastors cannot. And I would like that to be very clear to all of us, my beloved Elis. Because many administrators are wondering, what, why do we need literature evangelists? And because they do not understand who we are and what is our spiritual gift and our mission, then we have administrators who unfortunately are not giving their total support. But this morning, I would like to request all of you to show to the church that we have a very important call, a very important spiritual gift, and a very important mission. Okay, now, here, what are these places that the pastors cannot reach? Can you give me some idea? Give me one. Eh? Where? An entered area. Yeah. Come on, just speak. Eh? Country. Village, yes. Yes. In the valleys. In the buses. Okay. All of you are correct. But you know, I was attending one church somewhere in South Africa. I don't know what the name of the church. And one lady raised his hand and said, Pastor, I know one place where the pastors cannot reach. I mean, we cannot go, but our literature can go. I said, what is that? In the bedroom of the customers. And I said, yeah. Is that correct? Now, I am a pastor. Pastor Mulambo is a pastor. But even we are pastors, we have no right at all to go inside the bedroom of the customer, right? Unless they request you to come. But even if they will request me, no, 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 no. But do you think our books can reach the bedrooms? That is where it's supposed to be. Because every night before they go to bed, they can read the message of Jesus. You see, that's one very good example why we need literature evangelists. Why we need you. If I were a president of the Conference of the Union, I have a very clear vision of my being an administrator, why we need literature evangelists in the church. But unless they understand that, I like to tell you that you will always have problem. And that's my challenge as a leader of the world church. I'm dealing with division presidents who appoints publishing leaders who have never sold a book. Because they don't understand. They, said they, they thought that anyone could be a publishing director as long as he has a name. And as long as he has a pastor's title, he can be a director. And he said, Pastor, please, you don't understand. 
Because they don't understand our spiritual gift and they don't understand our mission. And so my beloved administrators are listening to me this morning. It is important that we know why we need a publishing ministry in the church. And why we need literature evangelists. Because we have a very important mission. And I hope that we all understand that and we will not make mistakes. Because if we do, we will also be misunderstood. Okay, what are these places, for example? I'm just giving you one. For example, large cities of business centers. <laughs> okay? Like the city of Johannesburg, Sao Paulo, you know, uh, Sao Paulo, Mexico, Sydney, Toronto, Delhi, Tokyo, Hong Kong, London, New York. Some of these cities have more than 25 million people. Now tell me, where are the pastors to reach the 25 million people in Sao Paulo? But listen, in Sao Paulo, we have 25, oh no, 21 million people. But praise God, we have more than 2,000 literature evangelists in that city. But how many literature evangelists do we have in the city of Johannesburg? What is the number of people here that the pastor's voice can never be heard and can never reach? That's why the church needs literature evangelists according to the plan of God. But what are we doing? Name big cities here in Africa. And, you know, uh, uh, like this, I went to uh, Warsaw, Poland, and saw, I went up to this tall building and saw the big city of Poland, the place of the Pope. And I said, how many pastors have visited these places? Unfortunately, we have only very few literature evangelists in Poland, but they are very active. You know, very active. <coughs> you know what they do? They go to amusement park, they sing choir and sing, uh, and sing songs, and later on, people come and they begin selling books. Um, uh, they, you know, they, they are very creative. But l listen to this. Do you think we have the pastor's ability to reach the, boy, to reach the people living in these tall buildings, working in the office? But put 1,000 literature evangelists in those places, and God can perform a miracle. Now, um, uh, consider the big cities you have. Here is the big city of New York. Here is another one in Frankfurt. You go to Frankfurt today and this high-rise building, how many pastors can reach this tall building? Unfortunately, we don't have literature evangelists because the church leadership do not see the need. Uh, I'm just saying, what if I have an administrator who say, yeah, let's put 1,000 coal here. We need literature evangelists from Africa. Let's put them in Frankfurt. Do you know what will happen? Okay, what about this in St. Louis? No literature evangelist. What about this in Hong Kong? Only one literature evangelist. How many pastors have reached? And I'm so glad that we have administrators of a vision. And now they are hoping that by the next quinquennium, we can put 1,000 coal porters in China. Now, uh, and I'm telling you, you know, it's, it's beginning. You know, in China, it's still a communist country. And so people are not free to sell. And so one literature evangelist came from Hong Kong and went to the border of China and started selling books, but the police will not allow him. So what did he do? He made a bed and put all his books under his bed. And so when the police would come and inspect the house, it's nothing he can see. But when the police is gone, he would open the bed. You see, it's under his bed. He would open up the bed and take his books and go out to sell. Nobody can stop a person by selling. Someone can, somebody can stop you in preaching, but nobody can stop you in selling because you can sell anytime, even at the middle of the night. Okay, now, this is our mission. Another one, in rural areas and mountains. Uh, this sister is here. You know, <laughs> I put this picture because I, I know she is working one day in a village that no pastor is willing to go to preach. And she decided to conduct evangelistic crusade herself and baptize 45. Amen? Well, I'm not going to tell you more because, you know. And there is a, here is a literature evangelist working in Brazil in the village. So another area where the pastors really cannot penetrate is where they are in the village. And so one day, the school porter came to me and said, Pastor, I'm showing to you this book. I'm working in the village. I'm a very humble, simple literature evangelist. I'm not even graduate in high school. I'm only grade 6 graduate, but I'm doing my best for the Lord. And I said, why are you showing me that book? I said, because I have a story behind this book. I said, what is it? He said, one day I went to a village and sold this book to a family. And this book was shared to the next, and to the next, and to the next. And I said, Pastor, 
let me tell you, just this one book. And he gave me that book. You know, he said, I have already had baptism of 41. <clears throat> 41 baptisms, just one book. Now, let me ask you, did the administrators know that? No. Only this humble literature evangelist that's not even recognized because he's not even a high school graduate, but he's working secretly with the power in his hand and by the power of the Holy Spirit. He knows his mission. And he knows his spiritual gift. And all it takes us, my beloved literature evangelist, is to know our roots, to know our gift, and to know our mission. And by the power of God, we can accomplish that. Oh, I can tell you more, but uh, you know, time is up. Somebody is showing me I have only five minutes left. Even in the territories of the enemy, literature evangelists can go. Do you believe that? Well, listen to this. This lady is a literature evangelist in Papua New Guinea. I was there a few weeks back, last month. And he visited a nightclub. No pastors can go in the nightclub because they'll be misunderstood. He said, but this is my responsibility. So he went to a nightclub and looked for the manager who happened also to be a woman and decided to sell a book. They became good friends, started giving Bible studies. And one day, that manager of the nightclub was interested. He began attending church and later on was baptized. Amen? But not only that, after his baptism, this lady invited him to become a literature evangelist. And during our early congress in Papua New Guinea, you know what? Oh, both of them are delegates. Are delegates to the, literate, to the early congress. Yeah. <clears throat> both the LE and the manager of the nightclub are now literature evangelists faithfully serving the Lord. Amen? He said, I'm going to serve God and I'm going to share with others what brought me to the truth. That lady knew his mission. Of going to places where pastors cannot. Okay, well, what else? You can also sell to political leaders where pastors cannot. For example, this pastor sold to the president in the Philippines, in Malacanang Palace. Nobody can do that. I have a very beautiful story to tell, but the time is off. And then there is another lady who wanted to see and sell books to the president in Brazil, but she cannot walk. And so she requested a friend to push her on the wheelchair. She is a literature evangelist, but she cannot walk. And she said, oh, no, stop your dream of meeting the president. She said, just push me, and I'll take care of it. And so friends push her. So, you know, the president came, and so many people, very crowded, and right through the crowds, he said, give way, give way. And people look back, eh, somebody's on the wheelchair. And so the people give way until she did not know that she was in front of the president. And right in front of the president, he said, Mr. President, I know you are so busy. I have only one business, and that is to share with you this book. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. And then she turned back and said, give way, give way, give way. And she was out. And you know what? Not a single pastor has given Bible study to that president, but this humble literature evangelist who cannot even walk, but he knew his spiritual gift, and she knew her mission, was the first woman to meet the president and give the message of God. You can do the same if we know our mission and if we know. Another one is giving to political leaders, I mean religious leaders. For example, this literature evangelist sold the whole set of the Catholic series to Catholic priests. Now, I wish that you have that book here in Africa, Pastor Moisey. Have you sold the book, uh, the Conflict? You know what is the Conflict series? I know it's time. Uh, three, five books, right? Are you selling that? Are you selling that here? Oh, really? Very good. Praise the Lord. That's the kind of book that we need more to sell in our time, my beloved literature evangelist. I'm hoping and I'm dreaming and I'm praying that the time will come that in the whole world we will sell the conflict of the AG series like the leaves of autumn. This is the book for our time. And I would like to challenge every literature evangelist to reconsider what you sell. To see to it that our mission is accomplished. Because these books have the message of God. This man sold nothing but the conflict set series to all Catholic priests. And after three months of doing that, you know, he came, he came to his director and said, Please allow me to have all the Catholic priests in our territory as my, in our area as my territory. And the director was laughing. He said, What are you doing? <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. He said, Yes, I know. He went to the archbishop, got a list of all the Catholic priests, and have a long list of Catholic priests, and he has started selling. 
And you know what? After three months, he sold 43 sets of the conflict series, all Catholic priests in three months. And he reached his credential goal in three months, all Catholic priests. Now, do you know your mission? Beloved, I can tell you more, but at this moment, our mission is to go to places where pastors cannot. Amen? We know our roots. We know our spiritual gifts. And I hope we know our mission. And by the grace of God and by His power, we can accomplish what He expects us to do. God bless you.